morning, everyone. How are we doing? Wow. Well, if you guys will go ahead and stand, let's uh, let's worship the Lord. <laughs>
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let So God we serve is really awesome. We just sing how he's holding on to us. He's he's loving us. He's the king of our heart, right? And he is the creator of everything. He's created this whole universe, right? And everything in it. And the Bible says since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made we see that, right? We, we can go outside and we can see the nature, we can see the trees, we can see the mountains, the sky, everything. And, and we know that nothing could make that. Only a purposeful, intentional God could. And he also made us, right? He made us and he's loved us and he's cared for us. And what do we do? We sin. We go against him. And he still loves us still sent his son to die for us, die for sinful humanity, and he gives us a way to be reconciled. And now, by our faith in him, we have this opportunity to live for him. We have this opportunity to respond with him. And so, as we sing this song, keep that in mind, that we can live for See your heart and everything you make. 
understand that you are the only thing in this world worth living for. And that we can't possibly even begin to live if we don't have you. So we thank you for, for giving us a way when we were dead in our sins. some enthusiasm here. I, a little bit more. How are you guys doing this morning? All right, we'll work on it, all right? If you have a Bible or if you have a smartphone or an iPad or something, I really would like you to use that electronic device this morning for the glory of God and turn to Mark chapter 4. And uh, you can use a Bible app or use Google or whatever. I'm going to be preaching this morning from the Christian Standard Bible. And uh, I was going to entitle today's message a dirty story, but I didn't want to be the guy that told a dirty story in chapel. So I'm just going to make this a story about dirt. We'll just leave it there with that. Um, but people who come into my office early in the morning will often notice and comment how tired I look. Like my eyes are bloodshot and there's like blue circles under my eyes. Part of that is because I'm so pasty, and I own up to that. I, I live in that life. But the other part of that is I have a three-year-old, a three-year-old who is really intent on destroying all my sleep patterns. And uh, about a week ago, it was a week ago actually today, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard this giggling. And I looked up, and there was my three-year-old, and she was buck naked. She had no clothes on whatsoever. And she's standing over my bed laughing at me as if she has done something wrong and she knows it. And I, I reach to kind of grab her to pick her up and I feel like this slick, goo-like substance. Oh no. What has happened? So I proceed to carry her like this back toward her room and throw her on her changing table to wipe her down. And I notice her face is red. And I don't mean like red with embarrassment. I mean like blood red. She has a blood red face. But it gets a little weirder. I examine her and turn on the light. She also has purple. She also has green and orange all over her body. And I proceed to walk down the hall and I notice all the way up and down the walls of our house are little multicolored handprints. There's red paint here and blue paint here, purple paint here. Everywhere there's paint on all of her stuff. And I go into her brother's room. And her brother, he, he could sleep through a tornado. He's, he's just conked out on the bed. And I see blue paint in swirls in the floor right in front of his bed. And then on top of his sheets, purple and blue and purple and blue. And I was like, how am I going to get this out of my beautiful Mississippi State sheets? And I've got all this stuff that's covered over in paint. I go into her room and it's paint. Paint, paint everywhere, and then I go into the bathroom. And I recognize my daughter has broken into the Crayola bath paints. And she has squeezed them all over the counter. And in the middle of the night, she decided to go on an art spree. And, of course, I throw her in the tub. I yell at my wife because she's got to come help me with this. We've got to pull my son up and put him on the couch so we can change the sheets we got to do all this stuff in the middle of the night, and that is why I'm so tired, okay? And, of course, I give her a stern talking to. Don't do this again, okay? And little three-year-old cuteness, she says, okay, Daddy. And, you know, you know, it's just not registering. So, a couple of days later, what am I doing? I'm sleeping. 
and I hear my wife this time, Ryan, come in here. And again, my daughter is naked, but this time she's colored herself in markers, and she's decided to color the house with markers. That first set of very clear instructions, do not color on the walls, do not color on your toys, do not color on your bed, it didn't take. She didn't hear what I was saying, or she didn't listen to what I was saying, or she didn't understand what I was saying. But whatever the case, she didn't obey what I was saying. And there's a difference between hearing something. There's a difference between hearing something and understanding something. And there's a difference between understanding something and taking that direction, guidance, or advice as it is given to us. There are a lot of people in this world who will hear the good news about Jesus over and over. There are people in this room who you might hear the good news about Jesus for four years of mandatory chapels, but it never clicks or registers in your mind why you should listen to it. Because you may hear it, but you may not understand it. You may understand it, but you may choose not to obey it. I've always been puzzled at that. Why is it that some people hear the good news about Jesus and they embrace it and they make it everything in their lives and there are other people who just, eh, they write it off, they ignore it, or worse, they, they do everything they can to get away from it. Well, Jesus gives another kind of illustration, an illustration about dirt, an illustration about soil. Because he was in an agricultural setting, not totally different from the place that we're in right now. And he was able to connect to people and to explain why some people received the good news about Jesus heartily. While others write it completely off. So look with me if you will, beginning in verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And this is Jesus teaching. And then I'm going to kind of be all over this passage. Jesus began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd was gathered around him. They weren't socially distancing for some reason. So he got up in a boat on the sea and sat down while the whole crowd sat down by the seashore. And as he taught them many things in parables, and uh, in his teaching he said to them, Listen, consider the sower, or you could just replace that word with farmer. Consider the farmer who went out to sow. He went out to plant seeds, or really just kind of scatter seeds. And as he scattered the seeds, verse 4, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it didn't produce fruit. Still other seed fell on good ground, and it grew up, producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. And then he said, let anyone who has ears listen. Again, some of you are probably thinking like what the original disciples were thinking upon hearing that. So what? A farmer comes along and he drops seed on different types of ground. Some seed drops on the ground, birds come in, swoop, eat it up. Other uh, seeds are dropped on rocky soil and it didn't grow because there wasn't room for the roots to take root. And then others came along, the seeds were dropped on thorny soil, and the thorns kept that seed from growing a lot of fruit. And then there was this other category of people, this other category of seed, mind you, that was dropped on good soil, it was dropped on good dirt, and it grew manifold times, good fruit on top of good fruit on top of good fruit. So Jesus doesn't often do this, but 
in this particular instance, he actually provides an answer key. All right? He sits down with the disciples after the crowd is gone, and he explains to them exactly what this parable means. And we pick up that description in verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Some are like the word sown on the path. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes the word away from them. And others are like seeds sown on a rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But because they have no root, they are short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Others are like seed sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those like seed sown on good ground hear the word, welcome it, produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 times what it is. Was sown. So the big question I have is, why do some people hear the good news about Jesus, receive it joyfully, and others turn down the good news of Jesus, or at least they never show any fruit or growth in their spiritual life? And Jesus answers that question with a story about dirt. He tells a story about different kinds of dirt to illustrate the different ways people respond to the good news about the kingdom. And this morning, I want to ask you a pointed question. What kind of dirt are you? I mean, you're all dirt, right? You know that. I don't want that to be offensive to you, all right? We all come from dirt. We were made out of the dirt. One day we're going to die and be buried in the dirt, and we're going to turn to dirt. I mean, that, I mean that's not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to depress you here. The question I want to ask you is, What kind of dirt are you going to be? Are you going to be the kind of dirt that receives the word of God, that receives the good news of Jesus, and lets that take place and grow in your life in such a way where you produce much fruit? Or are you going to be like so many people who come in and they hear these things about the kingdom? They hear the gospel week in and week out, but it never clicks and it never develops in their life. So three key players in this story you need to know about. First and foremost, there's the farmer. There is the farmer, the sower, okay? And he's the one who declares God's word. In this case, Jesus. There is the seed. The seed is the word of God, the message, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And then there's the dirt. These are the different ways that people receive the word of God. So let's go over four different types of dirt. First and foremost, the first type of dirt. Look in verse 3 and verse 4. Listen, the farmer who went out to sow seeds, he sowed and some fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Verse 15, some are like a, the word sown on the path. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them. Jesus describes this type of dirt like a path. Now, a path in Jesus' day would not be like the paths that we're used to when we have concrete sidewalks or we have, you know, blacktop surfaces. We have, you know, these really nice smooth surfaces. Ancient world paths would not have been like that. But they would have been so stomped on and so walked on that they would have been hard padded down to the ground, and there's really not a lot of room for something to grow out of that, especially when birds come along, as Jesus says, and they pick up the seeds that never take root. They're just sitting there on top of the dirt, so birds come by, they fly over, and they pick up those seeds. So Jesus tells us plainly, some of you will never believe in Jesus because Satan comes away and takes away the seed that is planted In front of you. Satan takes the word away from people in a number of different ways. Sometimes Satan does this by distracting people. Sometimes he does this by distracting people. 
and people can be distracted by a number of things. Think about all the excuses people make for not following Jesus. Well, uh, I can't go to church right now. I'm, I'm real busy. I got a lot of things going on at work. Uh, you know, I, I can't go to church right now. I, I'm, 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 I'm really working on, on this part of my life. I, I, we've got games that weekend. There's, there's better stuff on TV. I'm, I'm, I'm really hung over from Saturday night. I mean, people come up with a litany of different excuses. Satan has a way of distracting us, distracting us with, with, with boyfriends, girlfriends, co-workers, children who won't let us sleep. Whatever it is that gets in our way, Satan has a way of distracting us, of entertaining us, so that we won't see what we need to see the most. My suspicion is that hell will be filled with lots of people who are really good at Candy Crush Saga. They were really involved and distracted and entertained. They had their kicks, but they never listened and received the word about Jesus. And that's a sad way to spend your eternity because you're distracted by stupid things. But that's exactly what happens to these seeds that are thrown along the path. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul says this about Satan, that the God of this age, that is Satan, the one who's temporarily in charge of things, or at least from outward appearances, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There are a lot of people in this world who will not hear or receive or obey the gospel because they are blinded by the liar. They are blinded by the adversary. They are blinded by the accuser of their souls. They are blinded by the God of this age who wants to keep people from coming to Jesus. And a lot of people walk in this life in disbelief. They unbelief. They refuse to believe the good news of the gospel. And I will sometimes hear people say, well, if God were real, and they qualify it this way, if God were real, maybe he would show himself to me. Why won't he speak to me, right? That's sort of a naive idea. I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but it's a naive idea. When God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus, he was walking around like an ultra-high definition image of the invisible God. When he was walking around in the flesh, guess what? He was still crucified by people who hated him. They were encountering God in human flesh. They were seeing God in human flesh perform the miraculous. They were seeing God in human flesh speak the words of God directly to them. But yet, merely seeing and hearing Jesus and all he could do did not bring them into a saving relationship with him. Merely seeing and hearing what Jesus does doesn't necessarily bring you into a saving relationship. In fact, these people hated Jesus all the more. Second type of dirt. The second type of dirt we see is the rocky soil. Look at verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly because the soil wasn't deep. That is to say, there wasn't much soil. There was more rocks than there was soil, so there's not a lot of room for things to grow, right? Not a lot of things, room for things to grow, all right? And so what we see, verse 16, Jesus unpacks this. Other seeds, these seeds, the seeds that fell on rocky soil, are like those who hear the word. They immediately receive it with joy, but because it doesn't take any root, they are short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. So, rocky soil people are those people who can hear the good news about Jesus. They can have an emotional experience, but their faith 
never takes root. I grew up in church, and one of the things, of course, growing up in church, we did a lot of youth camps, children's camps, every camp that my parents could send me away to where I could be out of the house for a few days, they would take that opportunity. I understand why now as on this side of things, all right? But I remember always the first night of youth camp was the speaker got up, the speaker did a lot of funny things. The second night, and, and the, by the way, the first day is when all those camp couples meet for the first time, right? Like, you're going to be my long-distance girlfriend for a couple of days, but I love you forever, right? So that happens the first day of camp. Second day of camp, the speaker gets more serious. And then third night of camp, final night of camp, you know what I'm talking about. It's the come to Jesus meeting. It's the night where everybody's emotional. Everybody's glued in. They're paying attention. And by the end, they're all weeping and saying, I'm never going to sin again. And oh, it's just such a dramatic moment. And then two weeks later, those kids that somehow came to my, to, came to my camp for some reason, I see them in school and they're acting like hellions again. And they, they don't even remember what happened two weeks ago. If you have a shallow emotional faith to begin with it will be rocked the minute tragedy comes into your life and the minute difficult things will happen and I find it so interesting in my life some of the people that I've known will use any excuse not to follow Jesus they stub their toe they bump their head oh Jesus doesn't love me anymore and then they walk away God can't be real and then I know these people in my life who've gone through such hell in their own personal lives and to see what God does in and through their lives, and they remain faithful and true all the way through. There's a couple at the church where I, I just left to come here, the church that I pastored for several years, and sweet, incredible, godly couple. And before I met them, they, I knew that they had an adult son who died of cancer. But yet they remained faithful to the call that God placed in their lives. They were serving. They were active in the church. Even though this hard and horrible thing happened to them, they were still faithful. In the time that I served as their pastor, they had another adult child die of cancer. A daughter die of cancer. They were still faithful and clinging to Jesus and walking with Jesus and making Jesus part of their daily life. And then... Another instance happened where the wife in this couple had cancer. She still walked faithfully with Jesus. And then her husband died of a heart attack. I had to go to their house in the middle of the night, an hour away, because my friend Gary had died an untimely death, and his wife, Patty, was still faithful to Jesus. And of all the family drama they had, all the other things going on, in all the difficult circumstances, they were faithful to Jesus. And I compare that with some people who show up, have an emotional experience at church. Maybe something bad has happened in their lives. Maybe their girlfriend dumped them. Maybe they have a work situation. I don't know what it is. They, they want to commit their life to Jesus. And I try to tell them this is not an easy call. This is, this is a difficult thing that you're embarking on. Oh, yeah, yeah, sign me up. I want to I follow Jesus. I want to be baptized. I want to do all those things. And then I never hear from them or see them again. They start ghosting my text messages, so on and so forth. If you live like you're the rocky soil, you can have an emotional moment with Jesus and you never grow any kind of fruit. And then there's this third type of dirt, the thorny soil. Look at verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. And it didn't produce fruit. Verse 18. Others are like the seed sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But the worries of this age. The deceitfulness of wealth. And the desire for other things come in. And choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. I believe Jesus here is talking about Christians. People who believe the gospel. Who trust in Jesus. They're saved. But... Their life never grows out of a place of spiritual immaturity. By the way, you don't grow in spiritual maturity automatically. I've met 19-year-olds who are more spiritually mature than 91-year-old Christians, all right? It has nothing to do with time, necessarily. It has to do with whether or not you are obeying 
and you're growing and you're developing fruit. And this is what we see in this description. They are warriors. People who are thorny, thorny dork, dirt people, dork people, thorny dirt people are warriors. They worry about stuff. Jesus warns us elsewhere about worrying about stuff. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body. Maybe you guys aren't that worried about whether you're going to eat a meal or not. I mean, it's, you're kind of in a comfort zone place. You've got great food. Most of you are on meal plans. You're not really worried about that kind of thing. But maybe you're worried about popularity. Maybe you're worried about your grades. Maybe you're worried about what people will say or do if you do decide to follow Jesus. How your teammates will look at you. Your perception of what other people will think. We worry about a lot of stuff. But worry can come in and it can wreck your faith. Then thorny dirt people are greedy. They're greedy. They want stuff. Jesus asks elsewhere, how hard is it for people who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? I, I, you know, I walk through the grocery store and in the checkout line you have those magazines there. You know, the Us Weekly and the People and all that. I mean, they're all tabloid garbage, you know, right? But it's, it's, it's who's sleeping with who, who's marrying who, who's divorcing who. And you would think, man, these people should be happy. Look at all the stuff they have. They're so wealthy. They're incredibly blessed. They're celebrities. They're famous. They're making tens of millions of dollars a year. But yet they are miserable. Because being wealthy doesn't procure happiness. In fact, being wealthy can put you at great risk for never receiving the gospel. Because if you got all the stuff and you can live on your own with all the stuff, you don't need anything from anyone, including God. And it will keep you from being in a close connection with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thorny dirt people love material things more than they love Jesus. Last, we talk about this fourth type of dirt, the good soil. Notice the way this good soil is described. Other seed fell on good soil, verse 8. It came up, it grew and produced a crop, and a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Verse 20. Others, like a seed sown on good soil, hear the word, they welcome the word, and they produce a crop. They hear the word, they welcome the word, and they produce a word. Again, the remarkable thing about your education, either as students or as student athletes, is that in order for you to have the best possible experience from this institution, you have to listen to your instructors. You have to listen to your professors. You have to listen to your coaches. And you have to obey what it is they're saying in order to grow fruit, in order to succeed. My son, uh, he, he loves sports. I don't think he's ever going to be tall enough to be in the NBA. He's, he's a little red-headed, you know, leprechaun kind of kid. Looks like this. You know, he's about yay tall, and he's not going to be super tall. But he loves sports. And we had him playing church league basketball for multiple years. And I'll tell you, there are a couple of years he had some just terrible coaches. I'm like, what is this dude coaching? I mean, like, I, I mean, I think... His qualifiers, he played NBA 2K for a few times, and he thought that he could coach the game, all right? Terrible coach. But then one year, we had this really good coach, and I was just, I was just impressed. He was, he, was, he was coaching so well. I could see that he was doing particular things with the boys that someone who had never been trained to coach before, like some of the other coaches we had, didn't know how to do. 
He was doing exceptional drills. He was teaching them skills. And he had a son who, this was five and six-year-old uh, uh, little church league ba- basketball. He had a son who I thought must have been seven as tall as the kid was. But I found out later the kid was four. And this kid was balling out. I mean, he was, he was, he was making long shots. He was making close shots. I mean, he was, he, was, he was incredible on defense and offense. And I was just sitting there thinking to myself, I mean, my son really needs to pay attention to what this coach is teaching. And I, and I go up after the coach, after the first practice, and I just start striking up a conversation with him. I'm like, I, I'm really impressed, coach. You're doing a phenomenal job. He said, thanks, thanks. And, and I started to ask him, you know, so you recently moved here? He said, yes. And I said, well, where are you going to church? And he said, well, we haven't found a church yet. But, and, I, and I keep on talking to him about New Orleans and that sort of thing. And I, and I look and I notice the coach is wearing a New Orleans Pelicans shirt. And I'm like, well, you just moved here. You've already become a Pelicans fan. And he said, well, I kind of have to be. And I said, well, why is that? And he's like, my son plays on the team. And I said, oh, okay. You know, I, was think, I said, Who, who's your son? Because I was thinking maybe somebody like third string, somebody on the bench you never hear of. And I was hoping that I'd be able to identify who he said. I mean, I follow the Pelicans, but I don't know all the depth on the bench. He said, oh, my son, Zion Williamson. And I'm just like, whoa. I'm having an existential moment. Zion Williamson's dad's coaching my son in church league basketball. (laughs) And I go back and I talk to my son. I said, son, your coach trained Zion Williamson how to play. His brother will be playing in the NBA sometime soon. Just watch for him. You could say, I played with Zion's brother when, you know. But I said, son, it doesn't matter at all what you hear if you don't listen to what the coach says. It doesn't matter at all what you hear the coach saying if you don't obey what the coach is telling you to do. The same thing is true with the good news of King Jesus. You can come in here week in, week out, and never for a moment grasp the meaning of the Word of God. You can never click. You can hear it a million times and never follow through in obedience. But here's the good news. Man, if you would listen you would obey, if you would commit to being the right kind of dirt, if you would commit to being teachable, God can do in you incredible and amazing things. You can be like the good dirt that grows fruit, that multiplies itself by 30, by 60, by 100 times. You can see God do something amazing so this morning before we go to lunch let me ask you a big philosophical existential self-reflective question what kind of dirt are you are you the dirt that hears the word satan grabs man i'm distracted i don't want anything to do with that you've been blinded by the god of the age Are you the rocky dirt who the seed never takes time to grow because you're so distracted by all the things that there are in this world? You have a a shallow emotional kind of connection to God and it really means nothing to you in a deeper and fuller sense. Are you the thorny soul, soil kind of, I'm going to get that right before this is over with, thorny soil type of person. You're a Christian. You might have heard the good news of Jesus, but you're too concerned about the other stuff in this world, and you're never able to produce fruit. Or are you good soil, good dirt, open, ready, and receptive? You're ready to hear, to understand, and obey 
what Jesus is saying to you. Some of you in here may have never taken that initial step and said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to place my trust in him. Right here where you sit right now, this morning, you can acknowledge before God, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus to save me. And just like that, you can start a new life. You can talk to me or talk to one of your classmates or teammates, talk to one of your professors, talk to one of your coaches about what it means to follow Jesus and live the Christ life. But my prayer for you is this. Be good dirt. Grow in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we can be like toddlers sometimes. We can hear your word a lot, but never listen. We can be distracted a lot by things that are going on. We can be worried about other stuff that keeps us from being obedient. And I pray this morning that by the Holy Spirit, the men and women in this room would hear your word. They would understand your word. They would receive your word. And they would act in obedience on what they hear. I plead these things in the mighty and precious name of King Jesus. Amen. One thing I want you to let you know is we are having PM in here tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Uh, Taylor Baker, the men's residence director, will be preaching. We're doing a series through the life of Moses this spring. I hope you can be here. See you later.